baptisms after service today. Uh, we're all invited to stay for Thanksgiving lunch at noon. Uh, yeah, it's going to be amazing. And uh, we have baby dedications during the service and the African choir. It's just going to be a rich, rich day today. So welcome if you're visiting with us. Welcome if you're a, a what do we call you, a, a family member who's here all the time. We're just so grateful. I'm talking, talking because people are coming in from the back. But we invite you to stand. We're going to sing all about Jesus Christ. We're going to focus on him today. And let us pray. Lord, thank you that in Christ alone we have everything that we need. And we focus on you now and we say thank you, Lord Jesus, for the salvation and the new life that you give to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today the same Hey, let's give the Lord a hand. <laughs> He's the one. He's all we need. We must stay focused on him today and every day. Solid ground, firm on the face of 
We stand in your power, and we thank you.
Thank you for saving us and giving us a new life and for being present with us today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand and uh, greet one another, if you would. Find somebody that you don't know that you might want to know. As we come back, if you are a guest this morning, please enjoy the service. Enjoy what God has for you. And uh, if you would, fill in the uh, contact card that's in the bulletin. Throw that in the offering when it comes by you today, and Evelyn will take note of that, and there will be some follow-up possibly if you live in the area. We would welcome you back. I think you will enjoy our time together today. We invite all of you to participate not only in the baptismal afterwards, you don't have to jump in. It's cold out there. Anyway, uh, then join us right after that for our Thanksgiving luncheon today. You know, I haven't said anything for a long time about this next subject, but I was reminded that we really haven't let you as a congregation know that the old property at 4002 North 18th Avenue is in escrow. That's a major praise. We can be thankful today for that. It should close here. It was open for about 45 to 75 days, and we're right in the middle of that now. So we will let you know when it finalizes, but it is in escrow. That's kind of a secure thing for this church and for the future. That's why you've been hearing a little bit lately about our tithes and offerings and our giving, because after this is all done, then we have to take over on this building. And that's going to be a major prayer concern for the next few years ahead. And so pray for, for the body as a whole. And as we take our offering this morning, just remember that as we close out the year. If the Lord has blessed you this year, give back that blessing to God in one way or another. Okay, uh, the announcements are up there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. You'll see that. Uh, you can take a quick note and read. They're all in your bulletin today. And so, Becky, is there anything else that we need to remember or is, where is she? She's, she's reading now, too. <laughs> okay, she says we're good. Okay, uh, let's uh, ask the ushers to, oh, I, I knew it wouldn't happen. Just a reminder, during Children's Church, there is a, a nursery for the babies. Under one will be over here in this room four. Only babies under one. And then during Children's Church, there's a preschool and, chil and Children's Church ages 4 to 11, or, and the preschool is two, 2 to 3, 2 to 4, sorry. So they, we do have, for those who are visiting us, we do have um, children's classes.
classes for all of them. So we're glad each of you are here. And just a word of caution, as we approach the lunch line today, we would ask that you keep the children with you, parents, because it's a lot easier to serve those lines if they stay with you and you can help guide them through. The meals will be served, they'll be dished out, so you don't have to worry about that. But we would like it if they would stay with the parents, and then we hope we have enough seating for everybody. We do our best to get chairs back out there if we need them later. Um, I don't think, Duff, is there anything else? Yes, let's bow our heads and thank the Lord for blessings and as you give to him today. Father, we do thank you for today. We thank you for what the Thanksgiving time means for us. We thank you most of all for salvation for each and every one of us. And Father, as we participate today to give back just a portion of what you have given us, we ask that it be used and used for the blessing of your kingdom in this place. In thy name we pray, amen. Good morning, everybody. So the song we're about to sing this morning is really short. It just says that, let me love you, God. Let me love you, my Lord, for all the amazing stuff you've been doing in, in my life. For all the blessings and amazing good stuff I cannot even count. So let me just love you, God.
Praise the Lord. It's what a, what a beautiful time of praise. Whew. We love you guys. Yeah. We are so thankful that God is blessing our family with some new babies. And so I'd like uh, Pastor Abwe and uh, Pastor Celestin, Pastor Juan, um, to begin with, let's have, if you guys could come forward. Pastor Becky, if you'd like. Pastor Ben, if you'd like. We're going to dedicate babies. Denise, would you mind coming up? Because I know you're... You love to hold the babies and give them a blessing. And I, I want you to hold other people's babies. <laughs> oh, just kidding. <laughs> so would the parents and the little ones come forward? And we'll ask Abwe and Celestine to introduce, uh, introduce the moms and dads and the babies. And what a high time this is. You know, Jesus made it clear that we must bring the children to him, right? 
some of the disciples said, oh no, children are too much, uh, too much matata, too much mess, too much trouble, too noisy. Jesus said, bring the children. And then he put them on his lap. He loves, he loves the children so much. And the scripture says that these are God's precious gifts to the parents and to the church family where we each have an opportunity to help them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand if that's going to be your prayer by his grace? You will help all the children in our church to know how much Jesus loves them, that he's their best friend. Thank you, Celeste. I don't know why. Here, let's use this one. The parents, if you can introduce the parents, please. Uh, this is Baruti, Baruti Triton. And uh, God bless you. The baby, his name is Francois Baruti. Francois. Uh, the mom, Sango Baruti. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, the following, the following is Rashidi Ekaso. Mom, Salima Pilipili. Amen. The baby, Selemani Kichas. The, the following, Asha Christine. The baby, Komia Jum. Komia Jum. God bless you. We're going to ask Pastor Abwe to come and pray for the, for the babies and for the parents and to lift them up to God in dedication. Thank you, Pastor. Acha tuombe. Mwenyezi mungu wa zamani zote. Kama vile Yusufu na Maria walivu mleta mtoto Yesu. Na sisi tunakuja na watoto hao watatu mbele zako pamoja na wazazi ni wewe mlizi mkuu sisi ni wazazi tu lakini anaelea watoto hao ni wewe tunakwenda kukwabizi watoto hao wa Mungu katika vitanga vya mikono vyako uwale uwatunze uwalinde katika kila jaribu lote la ulimwengu huu kwani katika ulimwengu kuna majaribu mengi na haya yote Mungu tunayakabidhi mkono mwako ili uwe mtangulizi kwa kila jambo kwanza sasa Na hata milele kwa mesha yao yote ni kwa Yesu alia buwana na mokozi wetu tunaomba. Amen. 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 Oh, let's give the Lord a hand for these sweet, oh, these sweet ones. Okay, moms and dads, the Lord will give you grace and patience and uh, will help you to get enough sleep and uh, to support each other and to teach your children the word of God and the love of Jesus. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, baby. Thank you, guys. Oh, amen. We're so grateful for each one of you being here today. Please, uh, please join us for the baptisms at 11.30. Uh, what time is it now? Someone tell me. I don't have my watch on. But there isn't a clock. Oh, 11.03. Whew, sweet. 20-minute message, the Lord willing. Thank you, Lord. And then please do stay for lunch. We have a lot of wonderful food. Uh, much of it is also healthy. But the thing is, it will make us... It will make us happy because we'll be fellowshipping together in the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for bringing us into your family, into your home. Lord, we do not take this lightly. It is a great privilege to believe in you, to receive the, new, the good news of the gospel and to know of your love for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. May every heart here today be filled with your love be responsive to your initiatives, and by your grace, may we be one in Christ. In Christ alone, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We've been talking about the Reformation because it's the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 
So we talked about the key doctrinal tenets or the teachings that were so important to be rediscovered uh, by beginning with Martin Luther, and then there were others, of course, who were also leaders in the Reformation. And we talked about by faith alone, sola fide, by grace alone, sola gratia. Last, year, last week, sola scriptura. Thank you, Ben, for that powerful message by the Bible and the Bible only as our rule of faith and practice. And today we're going to capstone with what really has been the message each week, but by Christ alone, solus Christus. Do you know that if you're a Christian, it's all because of Jesus? That sounds like a trite thing to say, but it's so valuable for us to stay focused on Jesus. Reforming has always been important. Reformation has been necessary throughout the, the couple of thousand years of the Christian church, and it's necessary today. It is. And so we always seem to drift away as a church when we lose our focus on Jesus. Whenever enough Christians don't any longer focus on Jesus but become all intrigued with all other things and begin to major in minors, then we see the church gets in a lot of trouble. We must be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Christians do. He is our all in all. It is Christ and Christ only. He is the reason we call ourselves Christian. He is the reason we understand the Christian view of God. God is love. How else would we know if we didn't have Jesus to show us that? If Jesus hadn't taught that to his disciples and then it was written in the word of God, God is love. Pastor Isam shared with me that there are 99 characteristics of God in the Quran, but not one of them connects God with love. This is a unique Christian doctrine and we're, we're not proud and big-headed about it. We're grateful for it. Amen to know the extent of God's love for us, shown most assuredly, because in Hebrews it says that in the, in the former days, in the old days, God sent his prophets. But in these last days, he has sent his son to make it clear. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We know God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Well, Christians at the time of the Reformation had lost their focus on Jesus. The church, for many reasons, had had to focus on other things. I think you know that the church at that time had become a major power with lots of financial asset, and it was necessary for the leaders of the church to run a corporation, basically. Many of the popes were, were more like CEOs. They had to be very clever with politics and money and, and property issues and things like that systems, and somehow their role had moved away from being a bishop or being an overseer of people's spiritual health because they were not able to just focus on Jesus, right? And people within the church began to not know that it was okay to know that they could put their belief and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that then they would have the assurance of their salvation, they, they, were, they had become very entangled in how do I respond to what God has done for us through Christ? How difficult is it to live a life of holiness? What are the steps and, and, and the different activities and accomplishments that are, are required of me in order to be made right with God, in order to have peace with God? And too many Christians, including Martin Luther, were devout but did not remember or know or hadn't been taught, it had been obscured from them, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. It's through Christ alone. You can trust him and know all is well with God. You can put your belief and your faith in him. You know, St. Paul, in the early days when he himself had helped to plant churches, discovered that many of the churches were beginning to lose their focus on Christ. Some people would come to the church, like in Galatia, and would say to the people, hey, uh, it's not enough to just believe in Jesus Christ. You need to also keep all the Old Testament laws and rules and rituals. And here's what Paul said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. 
Now that's the truth, my friends. It's not about circumcision or food rules or the 613 other things. Uh, those all have their value in their context, but the truth we must be sure of is all about Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Amen. But we need that 100% assurance that comes only through Christ. Because as much as I try to eat healthy, you can see me, you know. I mean, I, I hope I'm a little handsome and not hard to look at. But on the other hand, if I keep expanding, they'll give me my own zip code. So, and I was raised vegetarian, yes, and prefer tofu over all that red meated. Imagine a Ruth's Chris steak, or would you rather have a little tofuti turkey? Tofu. But, you know, that's not the truth, right? Whether or not you should eat shellfish. Whether or not, even in Romans 14, it even broadens it out to the Old Testament law, including Sabbath days. Does that mean Sabbath's a bad idea? No, we need the rest of the Sabbath, especially the resting in Christ. There remains a Sabbath for the people of God, right? We are made one in Christ, one with God through Christ. So these, this truth, Christ and Christ alone, are you believing in him and do you know you can trust him? So when we speak of faith alone and grace alone and scripture alone, all of these have their point in the insistence upon Christ alone. He is the one through whom grace and truth have come. He's the one in whom we are to believe. He is the one to whom scripture bears witness. When Luther discovered the gospel, he said, quote, in my heart there, there rules but one article of faith, Christ alone. Christ is the beginning. Christ is the middle. Christ is the end of all my theology. Here's a guy that finally found relief. How did he spell relief? C-H-R-I-S-T. Oh, a devout monk who could not find peace with God until he discovered the gospel, the truth, the best truth anyone will ever know, that it's in Christ alone that we're made one with God, that our sins are forgiven, that we are given peace. When we say, in, in a short summary here, when we say by faith alone, our emphasis is not on our faith or our belief. What is our emphasis on? It's who? It's on Him in whom our belief and our faith are anchored. Like the apostle said, I know whom I have believed. He didn't say, I know what I believe. I know in whom I have believed. Faith is the total belief in Him. The gospel doesn't say, go and do this or go and accomplish this, go meet this requirement. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amen. All right, church, good. Now, when we say by grace alone, we echo St. Paul's statement where he said, by the free gift of God's grace, men, humans, are put right with him through Christ Jesus. Here's an insight into the heart of God that comes to us from the Christian New Testament. It's this amazing discovery we make that God has it in his heart to love sinners just the way we are. Isn't that amazing? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? His grace does not seek a lovable object, but creates it, said Martin Luther. His grace does not seek someone, something worthy of his love, but seeks someone, everyone who is been created by him and who is part of the fall and turns them by his love into something lovable. Sinners are not loved because they are lovely. They are lovely because they are loved. Those are the words of Martin Luther. He discovered the gospel makes all the difference. The scripture said we love why? Because he first loved us. We respond. His love does all of the work. You know in the Christian message when it's authentic, there's a radical Christ-centeredness. I was determined, Paul said, to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. And Peter said, salvation is to be found through him alone. For there's no one else in the world whose name God has given to men by whom we can be saved. Wow. Church, today I want to challenge you. Lift up your eyes and see Christ and Christ alone. Will you do that? Amen. Ooh, he tenderly draws us to himself. He says, come to me if, you're, if, you, if you are full of labor and you're heavily laden. Come to me, I will give you rest. 
see Jesus as the incarnate Son of God who enters into all the experiences of our life. The joy, the pain, the suffering, the sickness, the delight. He's there with us in all of it. He is the one who makes God real to us. See him and him alone, church. Above all else, see him as your crucified Savior, as he endures unspeakable anguish for your sins and mine. Many people have said, well, who is Jesus? He, he was a great teacher, right? Yes. He was a very, very good man. Uh, an important historical figure. He's been called a mystic or a sage or a peasant rabbi. Who is Jesus? Who does the scripture say is Jesus Christ? First, John 3, 16. Would you say that scripture with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He is the only son of God. That's who, that's who Jesus is. Say it with me. He is the only son of God. Second, Acts 4.12, he's the only name. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. He is the only name. And then third, the scripture says in John 14, 6, he is the only way. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way. 1 Timothy 2, 5, he is the only mediator between God and man. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And the fifth one I want to mention, Hebrews 10, 12, says that he's the only sacrifice for sin. None of our sacrifice, none of our works, nothing we can do can add to a complete and completed salvation through Christ. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Oh, so Jesus is the only prophet we need. I sent these sermon notes to a Seventh-day Adventist friend of mine. Oh, she's so sweet. She's visited our church a number of times over the years. And I wrote, I know you guys don't hold up the prophet along with the Bible, do you? <laughs> because, you know, that's my background, so I can be cheeky. We don't need any other prophet than what the Lord has provided in the person of Jesus Christ. We don't need other self-proclaimed prophets to reveal God's word or will. I just picked on Sam that because that's my tribal family of birth. There are so many spiritual gurus who are selling millions of books, proclaiming to be this and that. I, you know, there's something about the end time gift of prophecy. I'm not dissing on that. I'm just saying it has nothing to do with our being made right with God or with our salvation. Amen. Amen. Someone right out here. When there was a group meeting at our church and I was here as the interim pastor, prayed a prophetic prayer over me. I felt a little, my father's English side got a little bit of the heebie-jeebies going and then my mother's a uh, little bit looser uh, Afrikaner farmer side said, just go with the flow, Duff, let's see what happens. Um, and she prayed and she did some things and she clicked her tongue and she spoke some language I didn't understand. I thought, what am I going to do with this, Lord? Help me to hear what's going on. And then she said, Lord, you brought Duff here to remind the church how to love one another. And she went off. And so I heard that one little bit. And when I get worn out and tired, it's because I don't think I'm succeeding well enough in helping you learn how to love God and love one another. Will you work with me? <laughs> no, you do. You're fantastic. But uh, prophecy has its place. But in terms of our salvation and the finished reconciliatory work that brings us to oneness with Christ. The only prophet we need is the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. You know what? <laughs> Jesus is the only priest we need. We don't need other human priests to mediate God's salvation. Jesus is the only king. We love our country. I, I love that I'm an American citizen now. I'm proud of it. My Australian and South African family are very worried about America. Uh, in many ways. But man alive, this is by far the best country to live in, and I'm so thankful for the freedoms that I enjoy. Uh, and I'm even willing to pay some taxes, but I don't want it to keep going up, up and up. But we don't need other kings. We don't need popes. We don't, oh, wait, Ben, we don't need pastors. 
to control our thinking and our living. We don't need evangelical gurus or subcultural influencers and cultic leaders. Jesus alone is the king of his church. Amen. Amen. And Christ is all in all. He's preeminent. He must have first place. He can never be second in command. You've seen this before, but if, if, if you see a bumper sticker where someone says, Jesus is my co-pilot, what are we supposed to encourage them to do? Change seats. Like, Jesus should not be your co-pilot. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not getting it done. In Matthew 16, 13 through 18, it says that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, you, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And only Peter voiced the truth. Matthew 16, 16, he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. My friends, if you want to know who Jesus is, guess what? God will reveal it to you. I loved the wall that Ben put out here last week because it reminded me and it made me flash back to going to St. Paul's Cathedral in London and seeing the grave of Dr. Livingston. Don't you love it when families chose to name themselves and identify their family from generation to generation as a living stone? as something so critically important. The truth about Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The truth about Jesus is the living foundation of the church. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, there's so many translations and iterations of that. I think he was indicating that the church will be built upon men and women who steadfastly proclaim the truth that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. That testimony of who Jesus is, is what Peter gave and where Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. He's really talking about on every one of you who has your belief squarely put in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world and as your Savior and you're sharing the good news of the gospel. That's how his church grows. You are a living stone. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Our connection to him. In our mission, it says to connect people to God and each other through Christ. It's the living relationship of you and me with God, you and me with those that God brings into our lives, and a living of the truth of who Jesus is. That's what builds the church. And it says that he added to the church's numbers. Jesus Christ adds the numbers. We get to be the living stones who are living the truth of who Jesus is. Amen? All right. He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Now, what are the implications for us today? Because my gut tells me we're getting close to 11.30. Are we there? We're close. All right. Because it's a full, beautiful thing. Baptisms, lunch together. The central implication of the Protestant Reformation is we are invited to come directly, personally to the Lord Jesus Christ without the need of any human mediator or any work on our part. This is not to say that spiritual leaders cannot be helpful, but the most a priest, a pastor, a Bible teacher can do is to point people to Christ. I like how Leonard Sweet said, pastors are not even under shepherds. We're sheepdogs. <laughs> it's like he's the shepherd. We're the ones that go yap, 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 nip, 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 nudge, 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 here, here, here. F follow the shepherd. Follow him. That's who we're going after right there. We want to be with him. Connect to him. Live with him. Learn from him. When Christ died on the cross, the second thing we learned from the Reformation, when he died on the cross, he completed the work of salvation. Do you believe that? Do you know that in your heart your salvation is full and free and assured because of the work of Christ? That's why he said, it is finished. John 19, 30, his death paid for the sins of the world. He had taken those sins upon himself. And when he died, he said, it is finished. It has been completed. Then a third thing we learn is God will never change his mind toward us. Do you know this, Christian? God's saving love for you and me is complete and it is eternal. So, as the scripture says, he who called us is faithful and he will finish the work of salvation that he has begun. 
endure. Let him be the enduring factor in your spiritual walk. And then the fifth point I want to just remind you of is, you know, the church is really called, according to the Reformation, not to preach any form of works, or today we would possibly say self-improvement. We must not settle for teaching self-improvement. I don't know how many pastoral resources are recommending that we do series of messages on self-improvement. That's the felt need of the people. Tell them how to have a great marriage. Tell them how to build wealth. Tell them how to lose weight. Tell them how to look younger. I mean, whatever the thing is, the church is going to help people know that. You can find it on any church around here. You want self-improvement, go to the local Christian church. They're probably teaching on it. I don't mean to sound judgmental. I just really feel that's not what we're called to do. We must preach whom? Christ. We must preach Christ. Apart from Christ, there is no hope of salvation. And where, where will people find this full and free salvation if they don't hear it from the church? Apart from God, there's no basis for self-worth or self-esteem. There's no sure foundation of personal growth or self-improvement. I feel like if I were to just overemphasize how to be a better husband or father, uh, how to be a better parent, how to have a larger income, how to overcome all your bad habits, I, I, want, I want to help you with that, and I want you to also help me with that. So first of all, it would be a little arrogant of me to, hey, well, I'll just give you the simple three points of how to have no more trouble with bad habits. Just come talk to the pastor. Oh, no, no, that habit. You have to go talk to Ben or Juan on that one. I'm being silly. But look, the only thing we can do is point you to Christ as your Savior and your healer. We are not going to just rearrange the deck chairs and the furniture on the deck of the Titanic. It's going down. And to try to tell you how to, be a, how to be a happier, more secure person while the ship is sinking. That's not a very compelling mission. We are not here to preach plain old self-improvement, although we want every one of you to live in abundance that is available in Christ. But we must preach Christ. Please pray for your teaching team that this will always be our focus. As we study the entire scripture, we look at it through the lens of Jesus Christ. He is God in human form. We are followers of his. Amen. We call ourselves Christian. And then if you looked at our church logo, we're reminded by the Reformation that the cross is central. The cross must be central. The cross was God's way of bringing reconciliation, God's way of healing divisions, of making peace. He made peace through his death on the cross. The cross tells you and me that God has done everything in his power to make us his friends. And God's work in Christ on the cross really is the only thing that can change my heart. God, says Paul, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to close with a short story that I read in a, in a book about the mission of Stanley Jones. When he was in India, he met a British government official, and as they became friends, this official told him how he became a changed man. He said he first became involved in sexual immorality when he went to Europe to study, leaving his trusting wife behind. When he returned home, he continued his double life. But the innocent trust of his wife stabbed him like a knife until he could no longer bear the guilt. And he decided to make a full confession to her. But he was afraid that if he did, it would break up their marriage. Well, the day came that he summoned the courage to tell his wife the whole wretched story. And as she began to realize what he was saying... She turned pale. She staggered against the wall and began to weep. Watching her, he saw his sin taking the life out of his wife. And in a sense, her love was being tortured on the cross of his sin. That moment, he said, I saw the meaning of the cross of Christ. I saw from a lesser cross the meaning of the greater cross of him who bore the sins of the world. And when she said through her tears, 
that she would not leave me, but would help me back to a new life, I felt the offer of a new beginning made by the crucified Christ. From that moment, I was a changed man. My friends, only the cross, only Jesus Christ's loving sacrifice for us on the cross can transform your and my self-centered life into a God-centered life. This good news of Jesus' salvation won for us on the cross is the dynamic center of the church's life and activity. A church true to the gospel is consecrated to the task of leading people to a personal, wholehearted, committed relationship to their Lord and Savior. That's why I love our mission, connecting people to God and each other through Christ. Well, let me close in asking you this. Have you ever wondered, and do you know people who are asking in one way or another, how can I find God in Jesus? Where can I find peace in Jesus? Who can break the cycle of guilt and shame through the forgiveness of my sins and giving me a new life? Jesus. Who can open the door to heaven? Jesus. Who can save a sinner like me and take away my guilty conscience? Jesus. Who can heal my broken life and put it together right? Jesus Christ. If you want your questions about the deep things of life answered, if you want your sins truly forgiven and gone, if you want to be sure of your heavenly destiny and to live now with purpose, happiness, and peace, then go to Jesus, my friends. Run to the cross. Go to Jesus Christ alone and let him be your all in all. Father, it's about you and you alone. Thank you for revealing yourself in Jesus Christ. Thank you for calling us into his family. Father, thanks for each one who has believed in you and has chosen to be baptized today. Father, thanks for all. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel.
all about you, Jesus. We love you and we praise you and we thank you in your holy name. Amen.